Bonjour, je m'appelle Brady. That is the extent of my French. We're going to need it today though, because today I'm at the Royal Society with Library Manager Rupert Baker. And we are going to talk about and show you some amazing things to do with, I would say probably my favourite structure tourist attraction in the world. It's the Eiffel Tower. Rupert, what it's have you got? the most popular souvenir in the world apparently as well. Most popular souvenir? Models of the Eiffel Tower, most popular souvenir oh. model in the world. So I, I read somewhere. I have contributed somewhat to, <laughs> to model souvenir Eiffel Tower purchases. Wall to wall Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Eiffel Tower. yeah. We haven't got a souvenir Eiffel Tower, I'm afraid. We have this. Now you get to hear my terrible French accent. You speak good French, don't you? I've been um, living with a French lady for 30 years, so... Oh, I hope picked, you... a, picked a few things up. Okay, then. We so, should have got my son in, he's better than I am. Your son's good, is he? Mm. La Tour de 300 Mètres. The Tower of 300 Metres. Was that its official name? Like, was, it, was that the, what people were calling it, or why are we not calling it uh, the Eiffel Tower? That's a good question, when the name the Eiffel Tower came into use. I mean, this book is by Eiffel, and maybe he was a modest sort of chap and he didn't want to call his own tower okay. the Eiffel Tower. So there we go, we've got a book, a bit of a spoiler there already, it's by Eiffel himself and he's calling it the Tower of 300 Metres. So the book was published in 1900, so that's 11 years after the Eiffel Tower was completed. It was completed for the Great Exposition in France in 1889, the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. But then the exposition came back round again to Paris, so Eiffel thought, oh, I'll publish a book of my tower. What was he doing? Was he selling these in Waterstones, trying to make a profit? Or? Not at all, no. As far as I understand it, they weren't for commercial um, sale at all. Um, he printed 500 copies, 500 copies of the text, 500. Um, copies of the volume of plates and just gave them to his friends, the libraries in France, other institutions in France and distinguished foreign institutions including the Royal Society. And his presentation letter is inside. Presentation letter, all right. So there's only 500 of these in the world. Oh my goodness, it's heavy. <laughs> all right, so a valuable and rare document this. And you mentioned a presentation letter. Yeah, so if you flick through, flicking on a couple of pages, you get the number in here. So this is number 246. Okay, so we've got 246 of 500. That's Gustav Eiffel's signature. We don't think that's a real signature. That might be like a stamp. It, it looks stamped, doesn't it? Yeah, doesn't the, the way the ink is sort of blurred into the page, yeah. it looks stamped. And this is very special because that is Gustav that Eiffel's. Is Eiffel's genuine signature. Look at that. That feels really special to me, seeing his signature there. So it's written from the Rue Rabelais, which is a great name for a street, Rabelais Street in Paris in 1900, to the director of the Royal Society in Piccadilly. Okay. So we weren't in this building in 1900, we were in Burlington House in Piccadilly. Just down the road. Mm -hmm. So I have the honour of sending you for your library the book titled The Tower of 300 Metres, made up of a volume of text and a volume of plates. So he mentioned in, in his postscript that he's going to send us a book of all the experiments done at the top of the Eiffel Tower in the little lab at the top of the Eiffel Tower between 1889 and 1900. I couldn't find that in the collections. I put Eiffel in the catalogue search and yeah. this was the only thing that popped up, so mm. I don't think we ever got that. Now this first book is more kind of the technical stuff, isn't it, Rupert? It's yeah. lots of mathematics and... Yeah, it's just... The contents page caught my eye there, so it's things like the influence of temperature on stability and the foundations. So yeah, it's, it's how they made this tower stay up, basically. Let's just randomly go forward. You see there's all these tables and statistics and numbers. And Starting to look a bit Eiffel Towery there, isn't it? That's Eiffel Towery, that is Eiffel Towery. Look at all this, look at all this, you know, sort of graphs and... I don't know what, fractions, mathematics and weights and... In the second hypothesis, so he's doing mathematical calculations to find the best way of making this tower stable. And there's all sorts of calculations in here about how, how much it's going to flex in the wind. If you are interested in the mathematics of the Eiffel Tower, this is the ultimate tome. I mean, I would love to just pour over every page here. Look at that. You'd have learnt French by the end of it as well. Oh yeah, that would slow me down somewhat, my lack of French. Here's the, the top, the little drawing of it and a schematic and... Far is lighthouse, isn't it? So sort of the light at the top. Oh, right. Lucky one of us knows a bit of French. This is amazing. Yeah, the wonderfully detailed drawings. Yeah, like he has just made the ultimate guide. And it's so big. <laughs> I love the little chaps walking along the uh, construction with their... Uh... I wonder if that's that looks like him. It could well be, actually, yeah. Gustave Eiffel? Maybe, I don't know. I'm speculating, but I think I've seen pictures where he looks a bit like that. Yeah, that's um, a non-workman's top hat, isn't it? Yeah. Well, look, a bit, a bit of colour. Colour does start creeping in some of these drawings, more so in the second volume, yeah. So this is the planche volume, volume two, the plates. The plates. Yeah. A different number as well. So what did we say the other one was? 240-something. Uh, this one's number 185 of the oh, planche yeah. volume. It's a different number in the sequence of 500. They're not mm. matching. Why would he not match the numbers up? I guess he had a pile of 500 planche volumes and 500 text volumes, and they just 
they got a bit jumbled come in, up. Come in in random. So if you've got a up. matching pair with matching numbers, that's <laughs> like, that's very valuable. That's gold dust. It was not quite as catchy, is it? The Tower of 300 metres. <laughs> but as you said, this was the tallest structure in the world at the time, so it was, you know. Yeah, I think it was the tallest till about 1930-ish. Wasn't it the Chrysler Tower in New York overtook it? Right. And then the Empire State Building. I noticed, Rupert, all the blank pages have got this little Royal Society mm -hmm. stamp. Is that done just for ownership reasons or like how? Yeah, it's done if, in case anybody sneakily comes into your library with a little razor blade and tries to chop the book up. So people could come and, yeah, people yeah. come and. So that's your identifying mark. So here we go. We're coming to some familiar schematics of the tower, as you'd expect. Hang on, people. Things are going to get pretty interesting pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and look at this now. We've got a bit of colour happening. Foundations, sort of a side-on perspective. Remember the Eiffel Tower legs are like that rather than straight up, so you've got the angles of the um, yeah, okay. the legs before they curve up to the vertical. These are just wonderful to look at. So intricate. Super detailed for the, um, yeah. the metal work, isn't it? Yeah. You feel like he was pretty proud of his tower, like he was pretty pleased <laughs> with it. Yeah. I would be if it was mine too. And I think at the time this is one of the most detailed sort of engineering manuals, engineering descriptions of a building that had ever been published. Rupert, tell me what purpose does this book serve at the Royal Society now? I think we kept it just because it's a very cool thing to have in the collections and original donation by Eiffel yeah. and, a, and a, a monument of a, a great monument as it were. I guess that's why he gave it to you, he entrusted yep. you to keep this film. Yeah however many years you could. You could almost build your own at home if you had took this book home with you, couldn't you? You could, you, you could. could. If you had a big enough back garden. <laughs> I love this, I love these, these ones here, these foundations with the colour, mm. like just adds a certain je ne sais quoi to the... Um, oui. Yeah. This is presumably premier etage, first level, that's where they had the little restaurant. So there's the Russian restaurant, the French restaurant, the Anglo-American bar. Oh yeah. And the Salle de Spectacle, the theatre. There's a theatre? Yeah. I didn't even know there was there's a There's lots theater. going on on the first level of the Eiffel Tower. Look, I could look at these all day, but we should jump forward to the pictures, shouldn't we? <laughs> we should. One quite interesting thing is that you get these big fold-out pages. So that's the explanation of plate 40, and then, and then you, you fold out to plate 40, so you can read the text in parallel with the illustrations. Even clever book design. I can't remember if it was during the initial building or during a later refit of the lifts. They had a bit of an en passe because no French company wanted to tender for putting the lifts in. In the contract, it was said that no non-French material could be used in the building of the Eiffel Tower. Right. So they eventually kind of got around it by getting the international branch of Otis lift which had an office in France to, to put the lifts, one particular set of lifts in. Now we're going into some very early photos, people. Look at that. There is no Eiffel Tower at this point. Mm -hmm. We've just got foundations, a hole in the ground. Vivid pictures of the solid piles at the bottom. There's the piles ready to hold the tower up. Isn't it amazing to see it like this? This is incredible. And a bit of Paris and in the background. a bit of Paris in the background, yeah. Yeah. Okay, look, it's started now, people. There's one leg starting. That's a, a toe, I would call That's that. That's pile number four on the 18th of July, 1887. So 1887 was the year in which construction commenced. Now the legs are going up and this temporary middle structure is going up as well. Famously part of the construction of the Eiffel Tower was this kind of fifth leg that held things up for a while and then they took it out at the end. So what was the date on the previous one, end of July? This is the beginning of December, so that's how far they've gone up in five months. They're getting up to the first level now. All right. There we go, it's, things are coming up, up a bit more now. You don't realise how big this is until you see these trees here in the foreground. Mm. Oh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go vertical, we're going uh, mm. into this mode Yeah, now. it's getting too big to put in um, landscape format now. Here we it? go, Rupert, here oh, yeah. we've got someone in the foreground. That looks like it's someone significant, doesn't it? Like, they're dressed up and... Yeah, it's obviously not a workman. I don't think it's Eiffel, the hat would be even taller if it was Eiffel yeah. himself. And that leg in the middle is gone now, yeah. giving us this nice view. 26th of December, 1888. They're getting close. I wonder if they, how close they were running to their deadline because it had to be ready for the exposition of 1889, didn't it? But yeah, we're getting there now, aren't we? 15th of March, 89. Got some structures here in the foreground too. Maybe that's to do with the exposition. That's building the exposition around it, yeah. Okay, so they're building the exposition, the big world expo around the bottom of the Eiffel Tower there yeah. as it's nearly finished. It was only supposed to be up for 20 years or something. It, like it was definitely going to be a temporary, stru temporary structure, wasn't it? Yeah. Like the London Eye was supposed to be temporary too, wasn't it? Yep, and people uh, like these things and they, uh, they get to stay. They grow on you, don't they? Yeah. Look, we're getting the lighthouse on top now. So we're, really, we're just about there. It didn't grow on the French writer Guy de Maupassant, did it? He's the one who famously had dinner every day in the restaurant underneath the Eiffel Tower just because it was the only place in Paris from which you couldn't see the Eiffel Tower. That's just stubborn. <laughs> I love it. I think, I think it's fantastic. Mm. There's views from the top here. Oh, look, there? yeah, we've got some views from the top. That's Notre Dame, is it? Uh, yes, it is Notre Dame. And oh, this I is see. the uh, laboratory at the summit. 
the Central Bureau of Meteorology. It's got a little weather and station at the top. Weather station at the uh, summit of the Eiffel Tower, whose experimental results were documented in that book that he never sent us. Last but not least, nice little map of Paris at the end there. All right, Rupert, I don't say this all the time, but I'm going to put this in my top five favourite things I've seen in the collection really? yeah, cool. in terms of things that I would like to have at home on my coffee table. <laughs> I absolutely You're love You're going really have to lock this away safely tonight, aren't you? Yeah, well, luckily it's well you, stamped. I saw you came in with a big coat today. So. <laughs> I will leave it in your safekeeping, but this is a fantastic thing to see, and thank you for showing me. Right, no, pleasure. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And a very special merci beaucoup to the people whose names you're seeing on the screen at the moment. They're just some of our Patreon supporters, and they make this channel possible. If you'd like to join them, go to patreon.com slash objectivity. There should also be a link on screen, down in the description, all the usual places.